Right, good, afternoon, er good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chen Bo Hou. I'm a research officer with IEDG here at ODI. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank, thank Marizo for his very interesting report. Capital for the Future, Saving and Investment in an Interdependent World. Uh, what I'm going to do here in the next sort of 10 to 15 minutes is just going to offer sort of an emerging market perspective on, on the report and uh, highlighting some key issues and uh, drawing some hopefully interesting uh, implications. Uh, first of all, I just want to sort of borrow Mariso's uh, graph and uh, draw, your, draw your attention to it again. And once again, this is a gross investment as a share of global GDP, historically and also looking into the future. Um, just let me repeat, as you can see in 2015, uh, we, are, we, we, we will be at sort of this breaking point where sort of uh, the developing world would, would take over the high income countries as, as the main source uh, of in, main source of investment. And uh, this sort of regi regime shift and or structural break as you like would continue uh, or accelerate into the future. And uh, also the second graph is also a graph from, from uh, the report uh, looking at uh, the capital stock uh, between uh, 2010 and 2013. Once again, as you can see, overall the emerging market is, is sort of accumulating a lot of capital uh, stock uh, within this time. And uh, undoubtedly, uh, China is gonna play a very big part of, of, um, in that process, uh, as its uh, capital stock is, is going to triple or if not quadruple in the next 20, 20 years time. So, um, so this is what we know. We know that a lot of capital stock is going to reside in developing countries and per perhaps mostly in the large emerging market economies. So where are they going to go? They are either going to go abroad or they are going to be reinvested into their own domestic economies. And uh, I'm going to lo look at both scenarios uh, in the next few slides. So uh, one of the channels to, to go abroad and invest overseas um, has been recently explored is, is by the BRIC leaders at at Durban, where they look at, they sort of played around with the idea of the BRIC Development Bank, and I think, I believe, they're pretty serious um, in launching it. And, uh, and however, the mainstream media has been fairly critical um, of, 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 of the summit because they, they thought uh, it was more of a failure than success. However, I, I would li I'd like to argue the contrary. Uh, I also published a blog, if you're interested to read it in more detail on the OER website. Um, my my reasons uh, for for develop, uh, in, in hoping that a, a brick development bank will be set up are the following. I mean, they have already set up some very strong institutional uh, underpins for 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 the development bank. They have agreed on the contingency reserve arrangement, about 100 billion US dollars to serve as a reserve pool for among among the bric nations, and also it's expected that they will. Um, each member state will contribute as much as 50 um, billion US dollars as a startup fund to, to the British Development Bank to finance the infrastructure needs uh, in developing countries, primarily in African ones. Uh, so this potentially, shall we say, is a way to recycle um, uh, the large savings in, in large developing countries into uh, infrastructure needs uh, in, the poor, in, in the poor developing country, countries. Uh, however, it's not challenge-free, and the British Development Bank has, haven't, um, haven't decided where they're going to locate their headquarters, and it's pro probably going to, going to be job work from my point of view. And uh, there are also questions remaining regarding who's going to be in charge, how different it's going to be from, from the World Bank, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next, um, there are going to be, if there's going to be lots of investment residing uh, in developing countries, I think there are going to be huge uh, international monetary implications as well, uh, in, per in particular for, for countries such as uh, Russia and Brazil. As the, uh, as the report has, has pointed out, there will be um, regional monetary policy spillover effect from these large emerging uh, economies to their neighbors who have fairly close trade relations with them. And also on a global scale, the Chinese currency, the renminbi, is, 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 is becoming an aspirational international reserve currency uh, who is probably going to sit on the same platform as the US dollar or the euro sometime soon. What does this mean for small to medium-sized uh, developing countries? Uh, there's some good news and bad news. The good news is uh, we are not, uh, th these countries 
will not just be affected by um, the QE2 or QE3 or QE4 from the Federal Reserve. There'll be a multiple um, uh, 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 number of monetary authorities they, they have to um, they have to be aware of, and uh, this could be stabilizing um, because liquidity, shock, uh, liquidity shocks would be uh, more diversified. However, on the other hand, it would also make the timing and extent of monetary policy more difficult to assess, hence requiring more uh, monetary policy coordination. And there's some more details on, 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 on the Chinese authorities' uh, strategy to internationalize the renminbi. It's, it's written by a Chatham House paper last year. Um, I don't have the time to go over it now, uh, but you, you could also check it up online. Um, number four, uh, over here I want to look at sort of the political economy. Just want to highlight the issue of political economy of, of FDI. Um, the World Bank's report argues that even in the very, uh, even in the gradual convergence scenario, China would account for 30% of the global investment by 2030. Uh, are developing countries as well as high income countries ready to adapt to this pattern or to, to this scenario? Um, what I'm saying here is it's not just developing countries would receive a lot of this sort of um, emerging markets uh, investment. Some high income countries also see the same investment arriving. As probably some of you have uh, uh, already know, recently there has been a headline grabbing case involving the, the, the Chinese telecom, uh, telecommunication equipment company Huawei, uh, who have just opened a headquarter, uh, their UK headquarter in Reading yesterday. Uh, they have pledged to make a 1.3 billion pounds investment into, into the UK, UK economy in the next five years, generating over 700 jobs. On the other hand, the Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence and Security have made some serious queries on whether this will pose a national security challenge to the UK, to, to the UK economy or, 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 or to the UK, uh, or to the, to the government. Um, and this is from some follow-up uh, sort of comments and, and statements from the, from the Chancellor, George Osborne, uh, as well, and uh, yep. So those would be some international, uh, those I have highlighted are the international sort of uh, sp uh, implications for, uh, for the change of investment pattern. There would also be uh, domestic implications um, as well for these high saving economies. And over here, I'm just, I'm just using China as an as as example. Um, right, so more money will be saved. How are the, uh, the investors or the savers are going to re naturally going to demand a high are looking for a high return uh, through more sophisticated financial products and through more uh, more sophisticated financial, financial service uh, service industries. And uh, over the years, the Chinese authorities have been very cautious in developing uh, uh, or deepening uh, financial markets in China. However, over the last five to, s uh, to six years, uh, since the financial crisis, shall we say, um, a number of uh, the, the, the microfinance industry have really taken off in China. And it's estimated that um, more than 4,800 microfinance firms are now in operation in China, a sevenfold increase over the last four years or so. And the reason why they're taking place, they are, they're really mushrooming in China is because they can offer uh, a higher, higher, higher yield than the high street bank. Uh, and usually they can offer about 10% compared to about 4% uh, by, by a Chinese state-owned bank. And they have really flourished. And uh, what I'm and the, the, the two examples I picked out in the in in my presentation, one is called Credit Ease. It's, it's a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, a microfinance firm set up in 2006. You can literally borrow money, um, uh, pretty much for 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 lots of a range of activities, from uh, school tuitions to to the buying a car or even to property mortgage. Um, and and also there are some web-based. Uh, uh, web-based microfinance firms operating and flourishing as well. Um, so the, the following the implications for those are also quite uh, substantial for, for, for authorities operating in these countries. Uh, for example, more sophisticated uh, financial service industries would, would also require more intelligent supervisors and regulators, as we all know. Uh, so to what extent you know, are these developing countries uh, monetary authority is ready to, to, to take that step, and to what extent uh, are the multinational uh, institutions such as the World Bank, the IMF, ready to assist them in providing the necessary uh, regulatory framework 
for those uh, uh, financial industries to, to, to deepen is, is a question we, we remain to see. Uh, thank you very much.